Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being early and for being with us here on the weekend. Uh, we'll start at 4.05. We'll just wait for more people, more participants to come in. And I'll share my slides. <clears throat> Okay, so I hope everyone is seeing my slides. Uh, just let me know if there is any problem through the chat. Um, so again, welcome. Uh, I hope everyone has had the chance to watch the story of plastic through the screening links we've sent. Um, and thank you again for coming in uh, for this very important discussion on plastics education. So today we've invited a few very um, important people or experts. Uh, we have Mark Friedman from the USA who is working on microplastics in the LA Maritime Institute. He's an additional speaker. Um, we weren't able to promote him uh, because we, we invited him after the, the two confirmed ones. Uh, next, we have Rebu from India, who is the co-founder of Wasteless and who has developed um, plastics curriculums on garbage, uh, like Garbology 101, and um, No Plastics, which is a puzzle game for primary school and grade schoolers um, to get to know more about plastic, its dangers, and its effects. Um, and lastly, we have Yasuyuki Kosaka. Uh, he is a marine biology teacher from Japan who has also developed microplastic curriculums for kids um, in Wakasa High School. So uh, before we start, um, I will be showing this program uh, for uh, everyone's um, information. Uh, we'll have 10 minutes for me to introduce uh, the program, introduce Break Free from Plastic a bit, and introduce plastic free campuses. Next, we'll have the presentation by Rebu, um, then followed by Yasuyuki, and then followed by Mark. So they will have 10 minutes each. Um, if you have some questions in mind, please write them down and um, wait for the QA session um, at the end. That will be uh, at 4 45 Manila, Beijing. Um, so after Q&A, we'll also have an open discussion on plastics education in the global south. So um, feel free um, to unmute yourselves and open your videos later or turn on your videos rather um, to be able to uh, see so we could see your faces and also um, get to know about your challenges in teaching in this evolving world with COVID-19 and virtual learning and also um, teaching plastics here in the Global South. So just a few reminders for Q&A. Um, if you would like to ask a question live, please um, chat an asterisk in the chat box and we'll um, cue you and call you to unmute yourself uh, and turn on your video if you would like to and share your question. So please introduce yourself, um, state your name, your position, your organization or your school or where you're from, and let us know who you're addressing the questions to. Uh, we'll also again call you when it's your turn to speak. Um, and if you're feeling shy today, you can also ask a question through chat. Uh, so introduce yourself, same thing. Um, and also let us know who you're addressing the question to and write your question in the chat box. So we'll cue these um, questions as they go. <clears throat> so uh, I'll start by introducing Break Free from Plastic. Uh, so Break Free from Plastic is a movement. It's a, a network of organizations who banded together um, to strategize and solve plastic pollution for good. So we have organizations from all around the world working at different um, stages of the plastics life cycle, intervening at these different points and um, working together to be able to achieve systemic change. So the goal of Break Free from Plastic is focusing on prevention rather than cure. So that means stopping the tap of plastic pollution rather than cleaning, cleaning, it, in up, cleaning it up at the end of the, at the, end of the line. And this is a quick glimpse of how we do this. So you see the plastics uh, supply chain above. 
um, from extraction to manufacturing to distribution, the point of sale to consumers, um, up to its uh, uh, end of life in incinerators, landfill, or water. So what we do is we intervene in between these points by fighting these petrochemical industries um, at the extraction stage, pushing for corporate accountability and pr production of plastics, promoting systemic solutions and systemic change, and building zero waste communities. So um, a few other strategies in a bigger sense, we have, uh, we push for changing of policies uh, movement building and also shifting the narrative, which is what uh, plastic free campuses is actually under. Oh. Um, so here we have uh, a roundup of different um, break free from plastic organizations and members from all around the world um, doing what they can at their end uh, to solve plastic pollution. So that brings us to plastic free campuses. Um, so plastic free campuses started last year. Uh, it's not the first plastic-free campus program that's ever been made, um, but it's the first uh, project under Break Free From Plastic where we aim to unite schools who are already plastic-free or are still going plastic-free and to um, create that network where they can share their thoughts and their um, struggles and their journey towards going plastic-free. So we create that wave of schools um, who are going for, who are rejecting plastic. So in the first year, we, from July last year, we created an organizing committee with different organizations from all around the world. So we have um, a few notable here like Plastic Pollution Coalition, post Landfill Action Network, Five Gyres. Um, everyone is notable actually. And uh, we have members from the US, Europe, um, Africa, Latin America, in China, in the Philippines, um, and India and the UK. Uh, so this organiz organizing committee has had the experience of working with schools who are going plastic free and have had experience assisting them. And we have banded together to create that uh, wave of schools, again, um, who are connected to each other into one global movement um, as institutions going plastic free. So we were very keen on um, connecting these institutions because uh, we believe that um, solutions that were implemented at a, at a school level could actually be implemented in a city level, a barangay level, community level, or country level. And we did this by initially um, having these sign-up sheets in our website um, to create contacts with schools who want to uh, take the first step to go plastic free. And we also provided resources for them from these existing organizations um, to create a simple blueprint for them to follow or simple steps um, to start banning plastic slowly and step by step, taking baby steps um, in their own schools. So we have schools um, from primary school up to university are already signed up. Um, and this is the work of a lot of our members or member organizations of Break Free From Plastic. Um, a lot of these schools actually started with baby steps by first introducing uh, an educational curriculum, for example, or even just doing a brand audit, um, which is a cleanup where, where we audit brands of companies who are polluting uh, our coastal areas and also our homes. Um, and we also have uh, universities again, uh, who have done story of plastic screenings um, and that's where their interest picked um, and that's where they started their journey to go plastic free. Uh, so uh, the PFC program also um, focused on giving micro grants to schools um, and students who wanted to campaign against plastic in their own schools um, and organizations who wanted to do initiatives such as these in schools near them. And all around the world, um, through our member organizations, we have 3,200 schools engaged who are doing initiatives to go plastic free. And um, we've also had a lot of learnings um, from the past year. So first year's lessons, um, not, not one size fits all for all schools. A lot of resources we've had or we already have from the global north are not necessarily applicable to the global south. And there's a lot of um, adapting that needs to be done, a lot of research that needs to be done, a lot of discussion that needs to be done. So 
Um, also, the funding that uh, that's available for different um, areas is different. A lot of schools in the global north could easily do this. Um, a lot of schools or people um, have a more mainstream view of zero waste, um, more than other areas of um, the globe. And also momentum gathering around areas is also different. Um, you will see that we have a lot more plastic free schools that are already existing in Europe um, and some in the US, but there's less um, in the global south. Moving forward, um, we are keen on ensuring that these tools and resources are adapted and accessible towards the global south. Um, we really wanted to focus um, on this area because we see so much momentum and passion coming from here. And yet, uh, we, need, we, we still need to develop that structure um, in these ways so that they could, they could um, address their concerns properly and also we could address how to support them properly. We also um, are, are focusing on traffic managing requests for support um, from participating schools and students from the global north to partner organizations that are already there. Um, so in the near future, we are already in development of plastic-free campus um, manuals um, in the time of COVID-19 um, so that schools can uh, plan accordingly for reopening if they wanted to prioritize completely banning plastics or slowly banning plastics before even school reopens or starts completely um, physically. Um, we're also in the middle of creating this plastics education manual for teachers. So that's uh, actually um, one of the important uh, things or reasons why we uh, created this event um, for teachers to feel uh, empowered and know the processes in how um, plastics could be integra integrated in their curriculums or their existing curriculums. Um, so again, we're um, keen on focusing on the Global South by pushing for micro grants um, and initializing a youth governed movement um, down here. Uh, and also, um, lastly, we have consultations with regional coordinators from Latin America, Africa, and Asia. So um, we'll uh, move on uh, to our first speaker, which is Free Booth. Hold on for a minute. Um, sorry for the technical difficulty. Um, please give us two minutes to get reboot on.
I remember being struck by it and writing it down in my book and then discussing it with the team. And it's like he saw everything that was plastic as one material. So he saw my glasses or this highlighter or maybe my mouse as all kind of one singular material, while in actuality it was really different. So there was some disconnect in his understanding. And we decided to create, to go on this lead and to see because we, we saw that this was his current understanding. And this was a lot, the understanding of adults and children around um, in our area. And so we decided to make a memory game, simple one. And we put in as an afterthought, after speaking to Babu, we put in these seven resin coats. Um, and it was really interesting. It was, a very, it was like something we didn't really think about, but it was something that struck out to us. And we launched this game with about 50,000 students. Um, it was a program called Garbology. And what we saw was a similar response from many children. And what they would do is they would flip plastic over, look for this secret resin code. And then the question back to teachers was all the same. So it seemed to ignite some form of curiosity with children. And they wanted to know, is this good plastic or bad plastic? They didn't want to know how to tell it apart, but this was their burning question. And so we, in echo pedagogy, in designing, what we're trying to do is to let students guide this design process. Um, so any of you watching, if, you, if you're educating children, this would be something highly recommended is to let them guide that process through curiosity because then they're pulling information to you. Um, and so we developed this memory game. And again, through developing the game, we wanted to focus a lot on letting children help us design these illustrations. So we knew the concepts from science, like using a reusable bag, avoid plastic bags. It's a good thing. So we knew that. Um, but how, how can we communicate that to children in a language that they understood? And we decided to pilot test everything. And you can see here, this is 2016. We're in the same school I went to as a kid. And um, we explained children about this memory game. We watched them play. This was a colleague, Moshumi, kind of seeing what are kids liking, what cards. And you can see Mukta here in the corner and she's showing two cards. And we asked the same set of questions, um, similar questions. We asked, what do you see in this picture? What do you understand? And what is this telling you? And the responses were so inspiring. So again, here's something guided by children. We're trying to communicate them to them in a visual language that they understand. I wanna show you just one card example. So, I was explaining that using a reusable bag is a good thing. It helps you avoid plastic bags. Uh, so we got this illustrator to design it. And um, it's funny that all 256 children said the same thing first. Like, what do you see in this picture? They all said ice cream. And uh, I, was, I remember being frustrated in those focus groups. Like, look at the cloth bag, it's the cloth bag. But uh, they saw the ice cream. And, and this is uh, in the design brief to our designer. We said that uh, using a reusable bag means you, you have a shoulder strap, so your hands are free. And generally people who use cloth bags are more positive. So she thought those two things combined is ice cream. Um, and younger children, like Tiara was saying, we go down to, to grade school or middle school, primary school as well. Um, younger children saw good and bad in colors and something we didn't think about at all. And her red dress signified something bad. Um, another thing that we saw, and Yasuki is nodding, uh, another thing that we saw was that uh, backgrounds, actually context makes a big difference to how children understand a picture, the environment. While if you look at trends like the UN or Red Cross or even the government of India, they focus on this very Italian design, which having a white background with a subject matter as the focus. And so this didn't resonate again with our target audience with children. So we took all this feedback and we went back to our designer and we made a new card, trying to have it guided by children. And so this is the new card. The ice cream is gone. Um, you see the background color where we were able to signify good behavior from clean backgrounds, from a beautiful environment with blue sky and green grass. And um, the color of her dress changed. Um, and even the color of the bag and the types of products in it, like oranges changed. Um, the tick box changed because they want something more prominent. So again, here, it's just asking children to help us design their education experience. 
And so we went on with this. And like Tiara said, we piloted it with lots of children. And then we wanted to go to our state government, that's our province here, and try to spread the insights of this education to a wider audience through conventional means like textbooks. So we're not taking a game to these classrooms, but really just the key insights. And uh, that came again by curiosity, because this is the Minister of Education, and this is one of our donors. And uh, he's teaching the minister how to tell whether something is good plastic or bad plastic. And, and the minister got his pet bottle, so he didn't have a reusable bottle. And our donor, after working with us for like seven years, has got his stainless steel reusable bottle. But it was interesting when, when Sengotian, uh, the Honorable Minister of Education, flipped plastic and saw this uh, resin code and wanted to know what it meant, he also got curious and he realized the value. So curiosity-driven education seemed to really information to children rather than us pushing it onto them. Um, so that was a key difference. And, and this went on for us to integrate, actually, um, these are the state level textbooks in the local language um, that are going to children. So we took these key insights of what's really driving behavior, what's making children curious, and we try to plug them in in a format that's, um, that matches the education format of the system. Um, so I wanted to share some key insights. Tiara was strict with me, and I'm almost running out of time. But we have a lot of science out there. Uh, Tiara was starting with, you know, what Break Free from Plastic does. And if you've all watched the video with uh, Steve Wilson, you'll see that it's so broad. The issue is so massive. Um, so if we're taking the issue of plastic pollution, it's massive. And to focus on all of this is overwhelming for children. So my first piece of advice would be to boil it down onto something small, something very specific that you can focus on not try to tackle the wide approach because this is overwhelming. And I see with children over the last 10 years is it just goes over their head and they switch off. They don't have that curiosity to pull it towards themselves. So focus on something was really key. And you'll see that a lot of the curriculum from the Global North, from all the partners that uh, Tiara mentioned, wonderful work, but it focuses on the science. It's reflecting the, what the academic community is saying, which is a lot of facts and figures, and it's very broad. And this didn't resonate with the children we're working with. So focus helps to resonate more. Um, another really, really important thing, and this has been a massive journey for us. This is a picture from a trash and show, a fashion show on trash. And um, we again are trying to bring these experiences into education because it's not just in the classroom. I see it almost like different levels of understanding or consciousness. And you could be at a very surface level of consciousness or understanding where you think, oh yeah, I know plastic pollution is bad. But if you can sink deeper, closer to your heart, then experiences drive that depth. Um, so taking something out, going out into the classroom, seeing plastic in the environment, looking at real pictures, watching a movie like Story of Plastic, um, but actually doing something. Like, I wanna show you this picture. These kids are like super geared. Um, they're super passionate about what they did because they actually went into their bins. They took out bits of plastic. This little girl cut a dress uh, made of Tetra packs. Um, so this boy had bottle caps uh, from his favorite juice. So when you do those own things with your own waste, it's so much stronger. Um, so build in an experience into whatever you're doing. Again, you'll see in the global north, this is not really reflected because it's difficult to scale. The most important thing in education, and this is what we look with, look for a lot in classrooms, and I think is overlooked a lot, is smiles and that sense of fun and joy. Um, and again, I think when, you, when you're looking at the science, it's very difficult to bring joy and fun into a curriculum because it's all pretty sad news. Even though we're all watching this now and, and you know, we're deeply passionate about plastic pollution, um, you know, the, the science and the news is very sad. It's very depressing. It's very gloomy. It's all about doom and gloom. So trying to weave in joy and fun and looking for children who smile and who enjoy learning um, seem to be a massive, massive part of, of success in adapting that education and pulling that curiosity um, to children. I think this again, with the Global North, as I was thinking about the presentation, Tiara, I was thinking a lot about the curriculums out there and they look a lot at judgment of 
wagging the finger at the same. And, and the plastic lobby uh, and, and the film story of plastic does this very well. It highlights it very well, is that we are to blame. It's us, bad consumers. We're the, and again, as I say it, I'm getting goosebumps because I know that it switches off the children's minds. This negativity and judgment is very bad for curiosity. It's almost like the, the kryptonite of curiosity. It sucks it away. Um, so avoid judgment and avoid negativity. I know we have to talk about the plastic pollution problem, but try to frame it in a different way as what can you do? What can you do at your own um, home level, in your own school, whatever budget you have, whatever time you have in your classroom, but not focus on mirroring science, which is looking at for problems and trying to measure something, which avoids, which is generally negative. And um, a lot of the approach can be negative. Um, sorry, a lot of the approach on curriculums out there, because it's also framed by the industry, is looking at judgment and saying consumers are bad. We're litterers, we're part of the problem. It's true, but it's not a good frame to get curiosity. And another important thing that we found in education, and I like this picture because it's part of a program where we caught actually children reflecting after they've gone through this educational process and it should be repeated. Um, we want them to reflect on their own. What do you want to do? Like you've learned the science now, what do you want to do? And that's what I love about this, the Plastic Free Campus Tierra and your work, um, bringing it down to doing something in your school, something concrete. And when you look at this boy's face and, and the girl writing down, they're really passionate and really deep in thought about what can you do as an individual and allowing that freedom to them rather than spoon feeding it. Like you should avoid a plastic bag or you should do this. Like we, we shouldn't be that straightforward with them. I think we should give them that freedom. And um, so reflecting and choosing their own solutions. And this is perhaps how it can be adapted from the global north to something that suits the global south is really that, that key process. Um, and I love India. I was at the beach last week with my kids. I have two little girls and my mom and dad used to take me to this very beach. And we go here often and often I'm, I'm obsessed about waste and I work a lot. And so when I go in the weekend and I, see lots of plastic lying around on these beaches, I tend to pick some up and, and my kids will look at me and be like, Dad, please, you're, you know, you're off, don't pick up plastic. And it's kind of a compulsion. Um, and Tiara talked about this also, we wanna focus on prevention rather than mopping up the mess. So cleaning up a few pieces of beach plastic really doesn't make much difference, but it's something I feel compelled to do. And I think this is something that I want to appeal to all of you educators out there is that we need to teach prevention now because we're investing in the world in 20 or 30 years. And you, it's not as direct. So we don't know we educate a child today and tomorrow he's gonna, she's gonna become the next Greta Thunberg. We, that connection is not so clear, unfortunately. I wish it was, but we don't know how they will act and how that experience and information, that precious education you give them is going to help drive the future. But what we do know is that we're going in a direction that will make the world look like this. And we don't want it. So we need you today to start something. Thank you. If you want to learn more about our work, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram. Um, if you want to look at our resources, they're all for free. You can visit our website. I'm sorry I've gone over time, Tiara. Once I talk trash, I don't stop. But uh, I'll end now. No problem. Thank you, Rebu, for that wonderful talk um, and for sharing with us your process, a bit of your process um, of that very long process um, of developing your curriculum and your puzzle. Um, and also for giving us um, a lot to think about with how we approach teaching plastic and connecting that to the bigger picture. Um, so Thank you for letting me speak. I'm excited to hear others, so I'm going to mute myself and uh, stop sharing the screen. Thank you, Tiara. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so for everyone who still has questions for Rebu, please stay tuned um, and list your questions down so that you can have the chance to ask him uh, yourself later. So next we have Yasuyuki Kosaka. Uh, Yasuyuki is a 
marine biology educator in Japan in Wakasa High School. He has been guiding his students in researching about microplastics um, and has been collaborating with students and um, educators as well in the US, Taiwan, and Singapore, and teaching them to solve plastic pollution or ocean pollution. So um, he's very interested um, in plastics and marine education. And through his research um, with microplastics, he has discovered a lot um, about the beaches and oceans and creatures in several countries. So um, let us all welcome Yasuyuki from Japan. Yasuyuki, please feel free to um, unmute yourself and share your screen. Okay, hi, my name is Yasuki Kosaka. Thank you for giving me this uh, great opportunity. Thank you so much. So I share so my Okay. Can can you my slide? Okay. Yes, you can see your slides. Okay. Let's start. So my name is Yasuyuki Kosaka. So I'm a teacher uh, in Fukui Prefecture Wakasa Sini High School. So today I introduce our students activity. So there are many plastic in my beach. <laughs> So Wakasa High School is in uh, Obama City. So in Japan, very rural area. So near Kyoto. So Obama is good fishing point. So uh, there are warm current and cold current meeting out of Obama Bay. So there are many fish and a lot of plastic. <laughs> Many, many. So, so uh, Obama is so same name. So Obama president. So, and so Wakasa High School has four courses. So international science, marine, and general course. Uh, very big school in Japan. So and has long history. So our school was established eight. 1895. So in 1896, uh, students tried to make new seafood uh, in this photo uh, by using unused fish. So we have solved many problems and tried to activate economy in the local area. So now we continue to research about local program, so like this. So for example, so some teacher uh, try to suggest uh, to local government about environment. So, but, so one student said, so in order to truly solve the environmental problems, not only regional, but also international research are required. So we start studies of microplastic distribution. So this is our student challenges. So first uh, develop the research method of microplastic and research in the world. Second, after research, a student discuss about each result and suggest solution. Third, uh, they take action. So for example, in this photo, uh, we held an uh, international youth conference in Kyoto. So this is a uh, research method, very, very easy method uh, from Sand, sand, beach, and so surface uh, by using sea 
and uh, through sieve and divide according to the side. Student uh, write uh, result in this paper. So by using our method, student can discover microplastic easily. So this is uh, data. So there are a lot of microplastic out of bay. This is Obama Bay, out of bay, there are a lot of. So student understood uh, this microplastic uh, coming from uh, another area. So, and next, uh, after research, uh, we discuss about result and solution. So for example, so Los Angeles High School. So Mark Friedman uh, work in this school, this school. And Singapore, Terra Linda High School. So they collect sand in the beach. And Taiwanese. So we collaborate with uh, many high school students so like this. And sometimes uh, students go to junior high school and they teach about microplastic. And we held so international microplastic youth conference. So this photo is a youth conference. So in Kyoto University, student discuss and so uh, he is Mark Friedman and he's great student. And uh, next, uh, we translate uh, microplastic movies in New York. So uh, this movie is uh, microplastic madness, very good uh, movie. So, and we, uh, we collaborate with so local NGO. Uh, they tried to make new product from ocean plastic, like this. So they gather micro uh, plastic from beach. So, and they make new products like this. So for example, so accessory and uh, make a dish from ocean plastic, very beautiful. So now uh, one student tr trying to make a chopstick from ocean uh, microplastic. So I am a teacher, so whole education from, from this. So I want to know, so uh, what kind of learning occur here through this research and how that does the learning deepen? So now we try to answer these questions by using performance assessment and qualitative investigation. And so we want to ensure the student learning and want to improve our science curriculum. So uh, this is qualitative investigation, very easy method uh, from uh, philosophy. So after research, I ask the student, what do you remember most in your school life? So they answered, and from their answer, uh, we gather important keyword. And uh, from keyword, we reviewed detailed background. So from background, uh, we can understand how to improve our teach and curriculum. So this is student description from interview. So, 
please look so communication skill and cooperating and uh, next motivation and so remember vividly and holding countries so bridge and region oh, this is japanese student and next los angeles high school student so same keywords so communicate collaboration and different people and change in their lives so we can discover a common keyword from student so for example subjectivity autonomy perspective for the future circle for exploration collaboration affirmation application to research and region so uh, student uh, through this research uh, student grow up these uh, this uh so uh, okay can I, can you hear okay sorry so uh 2020's goal uh we want to suggest the solution to international institution and local government and join in youth conference in Taiwan uh, this in this year. So next November. So please join uh, this uh, youth conference in Taiwan. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yasuyuki, for sharing your microplastics um, method of research with us. It's very easy to do and replicate for other people. Um, and I understand that this is also free for um, others to use if they wanted to and also to collaborate with you. So you have you also have Yasuyuki's details here. Thank you, Yasuyuki. Thank you. Uh, so now um, we are supposed to have one more panelist, Mark Friedman, who is uh, from LA, um, but I'm not sure if he's here yet, um, our additional speaker. Um, and it's also 1 a.m. for him, actually. So uh, I, 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 I wouldn't uh, expect him to um, have a, a, a perfect attendance for this one. Um, so. For now, um, if Mark isn't here, Mark, if you're here, please let me know through the chat. I'm just um, having some technical difficulties, so I can't see you. Uh, but for now, we can move on to um, having our question and answer uh, with our panelists. So if you have a question, oh, um, you can um, enter it in the chat, or alternatively, you can also chat up an asterisk, and we'll I'll give you um, an opportunity to speak by turning your um, uh, microphone on. Oh, Mark is here. Okay. Mm. Hold on. Uh, Mark, have you been promoted to panelist? Okay, there. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Oh, okay, so we'll, we'll move on with Mark's presentation. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining us um, in the middle of the morning uh, before we do our Q&A. So I'll introduce you for a bit uh, before I turn the mic over to you. Uh, so Mark is a marine science educator in the LA Maritime Institute in Los Angeles, um, having taught in an inner city Los Angeles high school um, he developed a program to hook inner city Black and Latin X youth in science through unique marine biology courses and club. Um, he has teaching credentials in biology from the state of California. Um, traveling ex extensively throughout the world, Mark has collaborated with marine science educators um, in more than 15 countries, freely distributing uh, his entire course. Um, he has shared his courses with us um, and shared resources extensively with hundreds of teachers. Uh, 
He's presented workshops at marine science and environmental conferences in Cuba, Japan, Belgium, Costa Rica, Chile, Honduras, in addition to the National Association of Biology Teachers, National Science Teachers Association, National Marine Educators Association, International Society for Evolutionary Medicine and Public Health in the US. Working with others, especially in Cuba, uh, Mark has developed full course materials in Spanish that has been shared internationally. So uh, I welcome you, Mark Friedman. Hello, everybody. And although it's early morning here, thank you, TR, for the invitation and to follow such terrific speakers. And I salute my mentor, Yasuyuki, who really, <coughs> excuse me, got me going on this with my students after participating in a science fair that his students organized in Japan. I bring you greetings from the United States, which might seem a little bit crazy now uh, with the elections going on and nobody can laugh. Uh, we're doing our best to change things here in the United States, politically and on the field of microplastics. I want to sort of follow up with what Yasuyuki was talking about in the importance of young people leading on this issue with his students in the high school and also with the Waste Less campaign. Students and young people learn better from their peers than they do from us. And if we can help mentor them, help teach them to be ambassadors of the environment on both a political level, a research level, and an education level, we will have fulfilled our job because this generation is the one that must change the way plastics is used and recycled on the planet. Just the same way that young people must lead in the fight against global climate change and all that that means and its impact on all of us, especially the ocean, ocean acidification and all the other problems that we know exist within the ocean. The three key aspects I believe are involving students in research, as Yasuki explained and set as a model for all of us. And we saw with a waste less effort, then the education of others, their peers, and then action. And I think sometimes environmentalists are weak on the action part. We think it's sufficient that there is education, but that is not the case. Without action on a political level to force governments and corporations to change the methods of distribution of their materials and what's called the circular economy of plastics not just producing the plastics, but the corporations being responsible for recycling them. When I was growing up, you did not have the extent of plastics. Milk came in cardboard containers with a wax lining, for example, as did most other liquids. In grocery stores, similar packaging. Today, 95% is in plastic and we must be innovative in the forms in order to reduce the pollution. The science is there, period. There's no question about that. Just like the science of climate change is there. What is lacking is the political will to do anything about the plastic pollution that exists in the air, the top of Mount Everest, the furthest most reaches of the ocean, 35,000 feet down, or on the surface of the ocean or the land. I wanna share with you a few slides. Um, so let's see if this works. Can everybody see this? Did it come across? We can see it. Okay, good. Is it full screen? There we go. Uh, so this is uh, a team of young people that we took to Cuba. They presented an international environmental conference in Cuba on microplastics, 
in a workshop with folks from a number of different countries. And here they were participating in an ocean cleanup effort. The origins of our efforts on microplastics actually go back to the establishment of a club. Um, in our school, um, we organized a club of ninth through 12th graders, so 14 to 18 years old, that carried out all different types of activities. But in 2018, after visiting Yasuyuki in Japan, we decided to launch teams that would work on microplastics, a number of different committees within the club and different tasks that they each carried out. Uh, with their activities, they would then participate in conferences. They would do outreach events at Earth Days, Aquarius schools. Uh, they taught on board tall sailing ships and cooperated with many organizations nationally and internationally which strengthens their resolve, which strengthens the nation and motivates other youth internationally to know that they do not have to start off from scratch. So this is the ship that we sailed on at the LA Maritime Institute. We carried out our trawls uh, with a manta trawl from five gyres um, and then we'd carry out our research in other areas as well. Uh, this is the, um, the Algalita research vessel that actually went out to the Pacific Gyre, and it is made of junk, um, the cabin part of a Cessna airplane that was down. And this is at the Alta Sea, the new big research center that is in San Pedro, California. So the purpose of the project by the students was to do the research, analyze the findings, propose solutions, and above all, carry out action campaigns. It is, as has already been pointed out, it's insufficient to just say, okay, I will recycle this plastic bag or this bottle. Those little measures are good, but it really takes action on a corporate scale and a national scale. And we've seen that with pressure applied through mobilizations, petition, letter writing campaigns, demonstrations, we have been able to ensure such legislation banning use of single use plastic bags, straws, etc. But there is a long way to go on this because the majority of the pollution comes from corporations, not so much individuals, although we do have to raise individual consciousness as well. Uh, we had a couple of different teams. This was the ocean team that collected samples off of a ship, categorized them, recorded the data, and uploaded them. On the upper right is a manta trawl, but you can use a plankton net um, with whatever gauge mesh and whatever diameter opening you have access to. We had a beach sand team. Um, that used a quadrat similar to what Yasuyuki used in terms of the analysis of sand and very simply, even um, if you don't have sieves, you can just put the sand in the water and watch the plastic float to the top. This was their presentation at a workshop in Japan where we collaborated with a group called Jovenes Ambientales Cubanas, which was young environmental youth of Cuba, primarily college age youth. This was a unique opportunity for these students from Animo High School. They then went out and did other activities like horseback riding. These are just some of the photos that the students took from Havana, from the National Aquarium, which is open to accepting visitors from whatever country, Philippines, Japan, and in the fall of 2021, we expect another giant international environmental and marine science conference in Cuba. Riding in a 1950s Chevy, uh, our group with Yasuyuki and others, his co-partner teacher there at the microplastics conference and that conference attendance and Jose with his little bow tie right there.
one of the ways you can do this is by organizing a club and our students as those of Yasuyuki are more than willing to help students organize their activities um, and how to organize a club whether it be different committees or whether you organize students through an entire class or one idea is certainly what we did through science fairs that took place at our school different committees that could exist to in a club to also make it fun to do research, to do field trips, guest speakers, coordination of a club. And lastly, if any of you are interested in contacting us, the students have a website shown there with the different presentations, pictures uh, from different conferences copies of a multilingual brochure that they put out to help organize others around the world. It's in several languages. Um, and we are also willing and interested and able to Skype um, some of our students with students in other parts of the world. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Look forward to any questions and answers. Thank you, Mark, for Number one, staying up with us, um, giving wow. us your statements um, for the youth, um, for us to think about, uh, and also sharing with us your processes, your curriculums and your clubs, um, and being very inspiring, um, period. So uh, now- Get my energy from all of you and the young people. Keeps <laughs> me young. <laughs> Smart. So, Finally, uh, we will be opening our, our platform for questions and uh, feel free to type or raise your hand or type in the asterisk if you would like us to give you the chance to unmute yourself and ask a question yourself. We already have one question uh, for Yasuyuki. Um, so this is from Bazan Amarildo from Brazil. Uh, so Bazan says, I saw in the presentation about microplastics that littering from the fishing industry in Japan and other regions is there. Is there any action with this industry um, since they are littering? Yes, so big problem. So uh, in Japan, there are regulations of plastic about fishing industry so but uh, so big for big program is the control uh di divide each state so one state so very strong control but another state uh, not control so this is so very big program so uh now so through research i noticed uh, and my student and so as a state st student noticed so in my state uh, there is no microplastics but so one uh, beach and one another state beach there are a lot of microplastics so from fisheries industry so now so we must suggest so japanese government and the state uh, okay. Thank you, Yasuyuki. Do you have, uh, I have a follow-up question. Do you, do your students reach out themselves to your government um, or your local government? Hmm. So uh, at first, so local government. So uh, in Japan, so Japanese government, so, uh, so control only another another country to another country. So Japanese country control uh, to another countries. So uh, local fish for local fishers fishermen. So local government control them. Okay. Okay. Local government control uh, local fishermen. So we must so both so local government and so Japanese government. Right. Thank you. Mm. Uh, Mark is also also wants to answer. 
Just to say briefly that we can inspire students and above all help organize them to pressure to get resolutions passed and enforcement. Not alone resolutions will do it, but it needs to be enforced by in the U.S., for example, Department of Fish and Game or other organizations um, that would prevent the dumping the question of ghost nets is a critical issue where fishing nets rip and then they're just allowed to drift and pick up animals and kill them. There is an organization that is innovatively in Chile taking old fishing nets and melting them down into skateboards and then selling them. So the science is there to convert plastic into useful materials or recycling. We are never going to be able to stop the production of plastics, but we can, one, make more of it recyclable, two, organize recycling on a real national effort that is enforced. Uh, there are companies that can now recycle plastic profitably, so uh, using that plastic again and incentives being given to them and those who do actually recycle. But again, it's the political pressure that needs to be applied by mobilizing young people, their parents, and the community. Thank you, Mark. Oh, oh. Oh, yes, okay. you. Oh, so uh, one student uh, told me, so teach me, one student teach me, so microplastic program is not natural disasters not natural disasters. Uh, microplastic program is social issue, social issue, not, not natural uh, disaster. So microplastic program is social issue. So one student uh, told me strong. And so uh, we can, uh, so, so we can solve this program. Thank you, Yasuyuki. Yes, indeed. We have another question from Anthony uh, from Nairobi, who is a program officer with the Inter Interreligious Council of Kenya, or IRCK. Um, he's requesting to expound more on the materials for the collection of sand samples at the beach and would like to follow this up here at the coast province or Indian Ocean, so near your area, if I'm not mistaken. So um, I think this is for Yasuyuki or Mark. So Anthony is asking about uh, the materials for the collection of sand samples. Okay, uh, please, please mark. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, so ma mark the mute. Uh, you're, uh, you're, you can speak, yes, so you can speak. Ah, okay. Oh, now you're muted. There. Maybe so now Mark is trying to talk. Okay. Okay. So this is a very simple way for just a few dollars. This is PVC, a uh, half inch, three quarter inch, four pieces with little elbow ends. And there you have your quadrat. Um, and this is randomly thrown on different parts of the beach, generally along the tide line would be best. And then just using a dustpan 
to scrape about an inch off of the surface and then putting that sand in a bucket and then if you have a sieve or strainer or you could um, even use like stockings or uh, cheesecloth um, or just letting the plastic float to the surface then skimming that off and separating it which takes time including looking at some of it under a microscope for fibers. Thank you, Mark. Uh, these materials could be accessed in your website, uh, if I'm, am I correct? Um, if you would like to refer, uh, you can go to the website. It's, uh, what is it again, Mark? Lam. <laughs> w, I'll type it into the chat. All right, thank you. We have another question from Jizali. Uh, what do you do with the microplastic collected from the beaches? So again, from Yasuyuki and Mark. Now I uh, introduce so method. Uh, so say my method uh, is same uh, Mark, Mark Friedman. So wait just a moment. So I I send so method paper. Uh, you're also sending your resource, Yasuyuki, in the chat, right? Mm. Okay, I I uh, I send a method attached to email. So uh, please, next question. The next question is, um, what do you do with the microplastic that your students collect in the beaches? While Yasuyuki hmm. is thinking about his answer, um, we do activities on board the ship and with students where we take the sand sample from the tide lines that would have plastic in it. And in teams of two, the students with tweezers will separate the plastic from the sand. In other words, the biotic from the abiotic. And they will find pieces of shell and wood in the sand, but also fibers, fishing lines, styrofoam, etc. And you can do this like a game with two minutes. Um, students could go out and collect the samples themselves. Then you come back to the class and then you have students like in a contest, try and count how many pieces of plastic they can collect. The second way of doing this is to obtain an albatross bolus. You can get this from an organization called Winged Ambassadors. And these boluses, which are the stomach contents of an albatross, because the albatross feed on surface food, squid, and when they die for the food for their offspring, they will pick up squid and plastic. They come back and then feed this to the offspring. It fills the stomach of the offspring and they feel they're full, they won't eat anymore and they die. So you can obtain these boluses free. And that's the other activity that we do in teaching students is they will tease apart a bolus and separate the squid beaks from the plastic. Um, while others are speaking, I will try and pull up a picture of that. Um, a bolus in the inside of an albatross stomach. Oh, I think Yasuyuki also mentioned that uh, they try to recycle the microplastic that's being collected. Am, am I correct?
no now so we make microplastic so so this piece we our student make now uh making so piers uh from microplastic so microplastic is uh so please uh, look look for microplastic so sometimes so very beautiful <laughs> very beautiful so uh very so several cards so now students uh make so piers accessory uh, after research. Thank you. And so now chopstick, chopstick. So mm -hmm. mm. chopsticks, so decoration. Uh, do you decoration. also teach um, or have a manual for what you do after research? Mm. Um, like after. how your students do this? Mm. One more, please. One, one, um, one more. So, do you have um, a written uh, process for how your students do this, or a manual on mm. on how they they make these accessories from microplastics? Mm. Yes. So, students, so now collaborate with so company. Okay. So plastic. Oh yeah. Mm. I see. Mm. Thank you, Yasuyuki. Mm, okay. So we have time for maybe two more questions or maybe even comments from our attendees. And also, uh, I think Mark wants to share a picture while we're waiting. So this is the material that will be taken out of a bolus. Um, sorry. I guess I can only share part of it, but you'll see the squid beaks and then the different types of plastic. Thank you, Mark. Oh, um, Ribu? Hi, thank you for meeting me here. Fantastic presentation, uh, Yasuki and Mark. I really appreciate your work. Um, we're, just, we're just working on a curriculum right now with National Geographic support. And uh, just last week, we finished the analysis of the science. We're trying to get a kind of um, understanding of what most scientists are talking about. And it's beautiful to hear you speak because microplastic has come out on top um, now as, as something all the scientists are talking about being a big issue from the global north to the global south. So fantastic. And I have a personal question because we're just designing this curriculum right now. And I, while I would love to take students out on a boat or trawl or even, you know, put out some PVC pipe and and do that, it's difficult to bring students with a class size of about 60 in our local schools, our state level schools, would be something similar, Mark, to your inner city schools in LA, um, really low income background, large class sizes. Is there any experience from both of you that you feel could scale to those students where you can't take them out into the field so easy, but we still want them to understand some. To, to feel something about microplastic, to experience something, what would you suggest? I would take a group of the students out to a beach if you're nearby or actually near a river in the stream bed and do a collection of sand or mud or whatever and then bring that back to the classroom for everybody to share. Um, okay. You can also ask for three, four, five of the albatross boluses from winged ambassadors 
and do that as another activity in class. So while some students might be sorting through the sand with tweezers, others can be doing the bolus and then they switch and then you have a conversation among the whole class. Uh, there are also a lot of good little video clips, as Yasuyuki mentioned, um, that are available um, on Algalita website, on Five Gyres. Uh, you could even Google YouTube, um, and some would come up there. Plus, Break Free from Plastic has their own. So we find that teaching to all the different modalities of students audio, visual, tactile, what's called kinesthetic, hands-on. You try and reach students any way you can, the different ways. Um, lastly, before we go, I wanted to say that um, we are doing a program here in LA with Yasuyuki, his students, students in Honduras and Ecuador, um, where we are having those students that are involved in projects zoom into cl classrooms here in LA to talk about their plastic projects to help motivate others. And I know for a fact, without af even asking Yasuyuki, that he and his students would be willing to do that with other classes in other parts of the world, uh, whether that be the folks from Brazil or wherever else. Um, it is inspiring to have students from other countries communicating, teaching, and working with students from your own country. It is self-motivating and inspires us teachers also because this, as you said, Ribu is an international problem. There's no national solution. Plastic knows no borders, just like climate change knows no borders. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Okay, so uh, it's 5.31 here in the Philippines and uh, we are out of time. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who joined and thank you so much to our panelists, Yasuyuki, Ribu, and especially Mark was up. Um, what all right. <laughs> thank you so much for uh, preparing such a wonderful presentation for us to learn from. Um, and learn about your processes and creating your um, learning curriculums for students. Um, we learned so, so, so much. Um, so thank you. And this is the first of many, I hope. Um, I hope everyone stays tuned um, for more to come. And I hope this conversation um, is the beginning of a much bigger conversation for everyone um, to start seeing how uh, to motivate their students to start teaching each other and start um, seeing what actually works um, for us in whatever um, context we're in, especially here from the global north up to the global south. So thanks everyone. Um, uh, Tiara, just curiosity, um, what countries are on? There's someone there from Brazil Yes. And I think this is a model what you've done, Tiara. Thank you for organizing it. And we can duplicate this for other countries and other groups of teachers and also involve students at, when that's appropriate. Thank you, Mark. We have people from uh, Brazil, uh, the Philippines, um, Kenya, and Europe, uh, parts of Europe. Okay. So uh, with that, we'll, we'll end our session. Thanks again, everyone. Uh, this session is recorded and will be uploaded in our YouTube uh, BFFP PFC. Uh, you'll also get the recording link uh, in your post recording email if you've registered in this webinar. So thanks, everyone. Uh, have a good day. Have a good night. Have a good morning, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Keep in touch. Keep in touch. <laughs> hmm.